Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, looks like most of our attendees have been able to join us here promptly at 1 p.m. Um, welcome all to the Data Visualization and Dashboard Design webinar hosted by John Daniel Associates. My name is David Kusick, and I will be your presenter today. To get started, uh, background on, my, on myself, I'm a business analytics specialist with John Daniel Associates. So over the past eight years, I've worked with uh, data visualization and dashboarding tools. Um, today, what I'll be sharing with you is a methodology for designing and building visualization and dashboards. So we'll talk a little bit about um, specific visualizations uh, and dashboard design principles, but really overall the, pre the presentation should give you a better idea of um, an entire methodology, a way to approach data visualization and dashboard design. In our audience today, we have a mix of both people who um, would be building visualizations and dashboards as well as those who would be consuming them. So it's always nice to have these two groups of people um, come together uh, sort of to, to see uh, an event like this. Both parties should benefit equally from the session um, and you should all have a better understanding of how to make your visualizations and dashboards more effective after today's session. A quick uh, agenda on our journey today. We'll be covering just very briefly data visualization's place in the BI landscape, um, the art and science of dashboard building, a methodology for success. So choosing the right chart type isn't enough. Um, oftentimes, you know, the, this is sort of a, a hot topic in visualization of I have this type of data, what chart type do I choose? Um, that is very important. But ultimately, that's not going to be the only factor in determining what, how successful you are with your visualizations and with your dashboards. So we're going to take a sort of a deeper approach, um, a deeper dive, a different approach to what that methodology for success is. We'll talk about using universal design principles uh, in dashboard and visualization. So these are design principles that um, are prevalent in web technologies, but also outside of web technologies. There are things that we interact with on a daily basis, um, maybe things that are seen, maybe things that are unseen, but hopefully through this session and some of the examples, um, you're able to integrate you know, your intuitive knowledge of design that you all have, because you all use it on a daily basis, into your visualizations and your dashboards. Um, I'll leave you with some tips for your next build. And then we'll do a quick uh, question and answer session if we have time. Please submit your questions through the QA panel um, or through the chat panel. And at the end of the session, um, I will read them off and get around to answering them. So thank you. The question that we set out to answer um, in the title of this presentation was is, is visualization and dashboard design an art or a science? And I think that this quote here is very fitting um, when we talk about dashboard design and visualization. It's really a mix of both. It's, it's where they break even. So to be successful, um, you have to have some sort of artistic perspective with design principles. And you also have some, have some scientific approach with uh, the type of charts that you choose for your visualization and how things um, are ultimately presented to your audience. Before we jump into the heavy material, uh, this is a, this meme is from uh, Futurama. So if you're familiar with the show, this is Bender. And in this episode, um, he's asking this entity, God, that you know, how does he know when he's doing things right? Um, and the answer is people won't be sure you've done anything at all. Um, I really take that as a guiding principle of uh, data visualization and dashboard design. Um, when you execute design correctly in dashboards and data visualization, people really aren't sure that you've really done any work on the design side at all. So it's very easy to pick apart something that's been poorly designed, but it's much harder to describe what's good about um, 
something that has been designed well. And it's because good design really is invisible, it just works. And another analogy you can draw if you're a sports fan would be um, an umpire. You're, you always, you never want to be able to notice the umpires. The umpires or the referees have done a good job um, when they're not part of the game. And that's, that's sort of the same approach, the same result we're going for when we think about the visualizations we choose and how we design our dashboards. We don't want those things to jump out at people. We want the information to come through um, with as little friction as possible. When we talk about data visualization and dashboards, this is a very simplified view of data presentation and landscape. Um, but I want to draw sort of this, um, this entire landscape out so we have an understanding that a data visualization is one piece of the, the puzzle and it may be part of a dashboard, it may exist on its own, it may be part of a report, um, but all of these things interact together ultimately to present data. And we'll talk a little further about context later in the, uh, in the presentation, but it's important to note that um, you know, data visualization alone is not going to make you successful or dashboarding alone is not going to make you successful. It's a mix of all these things working together um, ultimately that, that does bring success. To summarize um, why we create data visualizations and dashboards, uh, I have a few reasons here listed on the screen and you can read through them. Um, and I, I'm going to pull this quote and it's from Information Visualization and Data Mining and Knowledge Discovery. This is a, um, a book. And the quote is, visualizing data is fundamentally about data reduction. Finding a view or projection of the data that reduces complexity while capturing important information. And that's what I'm summarizing here on the screen. All these things do that. It's important to keep in mind when creating visualizations and dashboards that that's your end goal. Um, and you don't want to be distracted by maybe some of the requests that come across or uh, maybe some things that you see in the information that look important and you're presenting those out in a way where the data really doesn't become summarized. You're viewing more at a detailed level. That's not the purpose of the visualization of the dashboard. There's other vehicles for that, and we want to keep those separate during your design process. Mixing them really takes away from the impact of what you're doing. So I want to build a I'm going to go with five, my five pillars of data visualization and dashboard design. Um, if we think about our, the previous slides of why we do this as our foundation, um, these elements are really the supporting structure of, of what we build those charts and graphs, the pretty stuff on top of. Um, the first one, and I think the most important one, is to build with a purpose. So a good purpose, um, uh, a good purpose statement, uh, I'll say, um, does a few things. It identifies an audience, it defines the scope for the data to be analyzed, and it describes actionable outcome for the user. And you want to have all three of those things when you define your purpose. This is the, the first thing out of the gate you want to do when you're looking at a data set is ultimately where am I going with this, what will be used for, who's going to use it, and how will they use it. And here's a few simple examples of uh, a purpose statement. Um, good, bad, and ugly. So the top one, um, which is good, it hits all three things. It has the audience, it has a scope, and it, it describes some sort of action that the users will be able to take on the data um, or on the resulting information. And then getting down to the worst one, um, it's, it's very freeform. And in doing that, you're allowing a lot of wiggle room. And that wiggle room ends up making, uh, making a lot of things look acceptable when you're building, and you, and you want to have something that's a little bit more um, locked down. So the other thing a good purpose statement will do for you is you'll be able to easily identify which type of dashboard or visualization that you're building. So I have three types listed here, strategic, tactical, and operational. 
Um, we're probably familiar with all of these, but I'll give you a, just a quick background of, on what they are. One thing that you don't want to do is make the mistake of choosing the type of dashboard or visualization based solely on the audience. So for example, just because you're building something for a group of senior managers, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be a strategic view of the information. They may also be interested in um, tactical or operational. And those are types of questions that you should be asking and ultimately should be going into the purpose statement um, that determine what type of dashboard you're building. So just a quick overview of uh, the three different types, operational, real-time, near real-time. Um, it, it's going to give an indication of what needs to be done now. Um, there's not much analysis going on in terms of cause and effect. Uh, it tells the users exactly what's what at this point in time. So tactical is updated often, but not necessarily real-time. Um, there's more contextual information. There's a lot of latitude for exploration and analysis. And there's some sort of thought behind guiding the users um, to insights and ultimately decisions. And then strategic is more performance tracking against established goals. So you're looking at larger chunks of time um, during your analysis. There's guided paths to causal um, relationships while hiding the detail information. So all three of these work together. They could all be built on top of um, you know, a similar problem or similar data set, but the way ultimately that the data is presented and consumed is going to be different in all three of these cases. So also keep that in mind. Um, try to identify you know, what, what are we going for here, what approach, which type of dashboard is going to be the best, visualization will be the best. So our second pillar is keep asking why. Everything in your dashboard must serve, serve the overall purpose statement. Um, if the purpose statement's weak, I mentioned this before, what will end up happening is, happening is that anything, any visualization that you throw on the screen because it looks like a pretty picture, you'll be able to somehow rationalize that it matches your purpose statement. And ultimately, that's because the purpose statement is weak. Um, and what you end up with is sort of a, a mismatch of visualizations inside of your dashboard that may answer some of the questions, but it, in answering some of those questions, it may also take away from um, the ultimate impact and what's important. So everything that you do, keep asking why and compare it to your, uh, your purpose statement. So thirdly, have a vision. Um, a vision is you know, how do we stay on track and make sure the visualization or dashboard fulfills its purpose. Um, by having a vision, you know, you're, you're right now you're looking into what will happen in the future. Um, so some future looking questions that you want to ask in developing a vision is, you know, on what devices will this information be consumed in the next 24 to 36 months? We know right now that it may be on our laptops and our um, tablets, but or will our executives want this um, on their watches? Will they want them on, you know, some sort of uh, maybe their phones or maybe a large display that sits in their office? I mean, these are technology moves at such a pace now that it's hard to um, today know what's going to be needed tomorrow. But give some thought in the development. Don't build yourself into a corner and having a vision will, will sort of allow you to Give yourself some wiggle room so the things that you build now will be consumed, be able to be consumed later. So some other questions you want to ask is you know, how many users will need to be accessed? How will that grow? How will the amount of data grow? Um, what will we do with new requests and changes in addition? So some way to triage as new requests come in to be able to have criteria that compare against and say, yes, this will become part of the application or visualization or dashboard that we built or this really doesn't fit, it needs to go somewhere else. And answering those questions up front makes those conversations and discussions much easier, um, ultimately preserving what you've done today. This is a quick screenshot of screen fragmentation of um, all the devices that run the Android operating system. And it's just to give you an idea of having that vision of, you know, which devices will our visualizations look good on. 
um, is it going to be all of these or is it, will it only be some of them? Can we accommodate um, everything that we need to? That's part of the vision. One other uh, tool that I'll use when developing um, a vision is using a, this storyboard and question flows. So this is a very simplistic example, but I think it will illustrate the point to you. Um, the first, you know, step on the left, upper left-hand corner is something that was asked for initially. So um, the audience wants to see some visualization that shows sales versus plan. Well, think about what they'll ask for next. And this can be done during a discussion. Um, you know, they may want to say, okay, the top and bottom performers of some sort of dimension versus that sales versus plan. And then ultimately they may get down to a lower level where they want to see categories, products, or stores that are driving the top and bottom performers. So having the vision to look into what this question flow ultimately is will help in your design process. It gives you an idea that you need to be able to provide a pathway through the information and not just a simplistic or even a complex visualization that maybe doesn't really get to where the audience is going with their line of questioning. This plays nicely into feedback loops. I've been talking about the audience, um, dealing with you know, your users or, or who will be consuming the information ultimately. I think oftentimes um, we end up in this paradigm where we have uh, one group on one side of the wall and the other group uh, on another, and we're through, sort of throwing information back and forth. So it may be a request that comes across, and then that request is processed over you know, a, a number of, t of days, and then the, it's sort of thrown back without any real interaction between the two groups. So if your process for dashboard design and visualization is to gather requirements, build, deploy, and move on, um, I think both parties are really missing out. It's not good enough to check requirements off of a list. You need to work closely with your users throughout the design and development process. Um, you could do this by using mock-ups, storyboards, help build that vision um, and support the purpose statement together. And when, when either the person who's building the application, the visualization, the dashboard, or um, the audience member sort of strays, Ask each other, how does this support the purpose statement? Um, where does this fit? You know, do we need to go back and adjust because it seems like we may be getting away from initially what we set out to accomplish with, the, with these bit set of visualization? It's better to catch it now um, than to build something that's not going to be used or needs to be redeveloped. And then the, the last pillar here is to steal great design. And this, we'll get in, into the next part of our presentation about which visual, how to use visualizations, how to use design, how to lay dashboards out. Um, a lot of this stuff has already been done. It's been done by people who are very good at it. And there's, there's no shame in taking something else that someone's done that's been proven to be successful and repurposing it for yourself. Um, of course, my next slide here, is also going to note that if you do that, you want to give attribution. Um, but don't be afraid to take a look at examples and use that as a jumping off point. Or even use that as a storyboard during your discussion with your users when you're designing a dashboard or a set of visualizations that, you know, we found this, we put no work into it, but do these types of metrics, do these types of layouts, do these types of visualizations make sense? Um, if that helps get the conversation started, um, by all means, definitely use something that someone else has done. Our next section is uh, the guiding principles of dashboard design. And this is really focused on um, the design portion and how things appear, not necessarily what appears inside of your visualizations or your dashboards. Many of the things I'll cover here are common design principles. They're used across all sorts of applications. So both in software and not software related. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it looks for design inspiration in places other than visualizations or dashboards. Good design really is universal. Our first principle is use of a grid. Um, information relying on the grid is easier to consume. 
Uh, intuitively, we all know that because uh, the types of things that we use that are laid out in a grid format, such as newspapers, websites, or even road systems, now, we know that navigating a system of roads is laid out in a grid is much easier than, for example, uh, John Daniel Associates is located in Pittsburgh, which we don't necessarily adhere to a grid system, um, which makes it very frustrating sometimes uh, for navigating the city. Uh, but the use of a grid inside of your design is definitely something you want to make sure uh, it's happening. This is a, a dashboard with a few different visualizations. Um, and these elements, some of this is aligned on the grid um, and some of it's not, but even elements that are even slightly out of alignment can cause fatigue to your user and diminish the usability of your uh, visualizations and dashboard. They can also lead to confusion and misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the data. Um, so things as simple as you know, aligning or proximity really does have an impact um, when, you, when you're presenting multiple visualizations side by side. So that's the, this is sort of the same information just presented um, a little bit more cleanly uh, in terms of a grid. It's much easier to read. Uh, it has a better flow to it. Um, so make use of a grid while designing. And you can do this if you're working in a web technology um, you're probably going to be forced to work on a grid anyway, but if you're, if you're working on something that's a little more freeform, um, you can always use, you know, um, here I'm just using a simple overlay over uh, an application to show how the grid lines fall. So those things to be found all over the web. Our next principle design is contrast. If everything is important, then nothing is important. Um, this is something that oftentimes we see almost <laughs> everywhere we go when we look at visualizations and dashboarding. Um, so contrast, obviously, here I'm, I'm giving a, a use of it. Uh, what's important is shown with the most contrast, and then something that's secondary or supporting, like the, uh, the tagline here, is shown um, in something that's in less of contrast to the background. Now, one of the most famous uh, well-known examples of contrast and how using no contrast can be confusing is where's Waldo. Um, this is a great example of no contrast. Even though everything is in color, so you may think contrast means black and white, um, contrast is really just the state of being strikingly different than things that are surrounding it. Um, and here, because nothing is different, nothing stands out. And if you found Waldo, congratulations. And if you haven't, uh, if we introduce some contrast into the picture, it makes it much easier. So whatever is important um, needs to be in contrast to its surroundings. And I'll give you a couple real examples of that. This is a, a dashboard with some visualizations where um, nothing is in contrast. The colors are really all the same and things are washed out. I don't know what's important here. Um, my eye doesn't really know where to start. Um, it's hard to really analyze this dashboard and, and pull any information out of the visualization. In comparison, um, this is a better use of contrast. So while it may look very simplistic in its form, um, I know it's very important Right off the bat, I have my, my total expenses. I know what is in red, what is not in red, um, where I need to look for further information. Now, in this case, the way that this dashboard and visualizations were designed and laid out, the actual versus budget at the bottom and the expense types over on the right-hand side, those are viewed as supporting information to um, whether or not the thresholds of the gauges are being met. And the use of the contrast and the color here is making it easy, easy for me to um, make that distinction as I consume this information. This is a, if this were something that were actually being used, it would be a very poor example, but um, I'm exaggerating in this case just to show how contrast can change the view of something. Um, in this case, each bar is actually made up of multiple segments, but because there's no contrast in those colors, 
between those segments, um, I'm unable to see really wh where things start and where things stop. And then here's that same um, information presented with some sort of contrast in the, the different dimensionality. And although Judy is sort of the top sales rep, um, I see that Stuart, you know, has the majority of his sales actually coming from higher margin products. And in this case, that's, that's what the visualization is. Um, but just another use of what contrast can do for your, your visualization. Our next principle is consistency. Um, consistency is defined as conformity in the application of something, typically that which is necessary for the, necessary for the sake of logic, accuracy, or fairness. Um, Anything that is globally applicable inside of your visualizations, your dashboards, should remain consistent. So these would be things like colors, fonts, size, um, navigation items, um, as well as proximity of um, different types of visualizations throughout the, the dashboard. This is a pretty simple example. I have a shared dimension across these two visualizations. This happens all the time within dashboards. Um, it's representing a status. In one case, it's representing the number of ideas, and in the other case, it's representing um, how many, uh, the percentage of projects. But the colors are not consistent between the two. So on the left in the pie chart, I have the approved status as blue, but it's being shown as red, um, in the chart that's sitting right next to it. If I'm consuming this information, I may glance over it and make the assumption that um, that my approved is actually very low in terms of the number of projects and that it's very high in the terms of the number of ideas where that's actually not the case. So keeping those colors consistent across the two as they are in this, in this instance, um, it reinforces uh, that dimension. So keep the colors consistent um, across your application, not only the color palette, but also uh, for each dimension that's being used. So in this instance, we're looking at consistency in placement and layout of objects inside of a dashboard. Um, this is a, a, one of those very simple examples that kind of goes back to the grid example. Not much looks out of place here, but my sales KPI um, tabular view is actually stretched uh, and the, the objects aren't consistently the same size. So although you may lose a couple lines of information here, um, keeping with design consistent throughout helps readability. So this is an example of consistency in size. Our next principle is simplicity, which stated here, less is more. At times, presenting um, users with one visualization at a time it is much more effective than presenting them with an entire dashboard of information. So in this case, everything has been has crammed onto one particular screen and it makes it very difficult um, to really make heads or tails of, again, what's important. Um, because I've tried to answer all the questions at once, it's really difficult to answer any of the questions at this point. And compared to something that's more simplistic, um, this is much easier to consume, much easier to draw what's important here. I, on down the left-hand side, in big bold numbers, I have you know what my high priority cases are, and then the information flows nicely. I have just enough to tell me that where those high priority cases fall, um, and if you know, I'm having any issues with the resolution time of any of those categories. So we'll talk about color here in a second. This is also a good use of color, where my uh, dimensionality is aligned. These are medium priority. Anything that's yellow here is going to be medium, and anything yellow here is going to be medium. This is this is sort of what's known as a silent legend. Um, I'm defining what this color means one time, 
And because I'm using it consistently throughout the, the dashboard design, I don't have to constantly keep uh, adding an additional legend to let the users know red means high priority. Um, I'm doing that silently through the use of good design. We, uh, this is a common request that we often get, uh, especially for people who may not have a lot of experience in data visualization or dashboard design, the use of gauges. Um, gauges are great. I have nothing against gauges, but this is a case where uh, simplicity would really help things out. Um, the, the problem here is I have to come through so much information to understand which gauges are exceeding the threshold. Even, even though a gauge is a very simple object, it's very easy to read, um, it's a good visualization for, for showing those thresholds. When you have so many of them presented at one time, um, it really loses the impact of what's important. So a better way to present this information may be um, think about just showing the KPIs that need attention. So you have a, you, have, you hide Everything else, they're still accessible in a way, but um, only the ones that are tripping the alarm should be shown. Uh, everything else is, that's in check can sort of you know, be off to the side. Um, if we only have 15 seconds to look at something, that you think about that. If, if the user can only look at something for 15 seconds, what do we want them to be able to consume in that 15 seconds? In this case, it, it's going to take me a good half minute um, to look and read each particular gauge and figure out what's on target and what's not. Uh, in this case, if I'm only showing what's important, um, very quickly I could figure out you know, what's happening. Our next principle is context. Uh, and I think this is a this is a great visualization of why context is important. Uh, something by itself, a single statistic, doesn't tell the whole story. And in BI, I think errors in context are probably one of the um, one of the most often committed errors. So the right context, right context for information is the one that really tells the truth. In this view, um, if we're looking through the context of the person who is filming. Um, it looks like the person on the left is hacking the person on the right, but you know, panning out, we're able to actually see what's going on. Uh, something for framing context that always helps is ask why does this matter. Um, if your answers are you know, because they asked to see it or um, because I've visualized data like this in the past and I've always used this type of visualization and I've always done it in this way, you may have a context problem. Um, some examples of why context is important. I have three charts lined up here, all showing the same information with a different context. Starting from the left with no context, we have um, total sales year over year, and it looks like the business is doing incredible. The, the sales are way up. But if we add maybe a simple context, so um, the forecast sales for each year, uh, we can draw the conclusion that, well, it seems like we're doing okay, but growth is still not hitting our forecast, but we're still growing, so we're still happy. And then if we look at it in terms of like a business context or a correct context, the, the context that tells the whole story, um, comparing the sales to the cost of sales, business might be in serious trouble because the increase in revenue is nowhere near uh, the increase in cost. And it, it may take you a few different attempts of comparing sets of data inside your visualizations to find that right context that tells the whole story. Um, but you want to be able to shoot for maybe it's a you know a combination of these two things side by side or in one uh, visualization that's, that's able to communicate all the information, um, the true story. I touched on using color briefly before, um, but just some tips. Use color judiciously. You have to use it consistently. 
um, stick to something that's simple. If color should not be distracting from the visualization, it should be adding to it. It should. It's not the star of the show. The data is always going to be the star of the show. The color is there just to enhance um, what's important about the particular visualization. Remember that certain colors already have meaning. Um, use those inherent meaning meanings in your favor. Don't try to go against them. Don't try to make something red be something good. Um, everyone knows red is bad. Red is soft. Uh, red is a warning. So continue to use that, that uh, meaning of that color. And then also you can use color to create information density and I'll give an example of that. This is a poor use of color. There's three blues just on the background here, which is kind of distracting. Um, there's multiple blues also inside of the charts in terms of the lines, the bubbles, the bars. In uh, the bubbles inside of the, uh, the bubble chart, the scatter plot at the bottom right-hand corner, those bubbles don't actually convey any meaning. So we've, we've added color for, the, for uh, the sake of making things look pretty uh, instead of making, you know, for the sake of making things more impactful or more informational. This is a better design and use of color. The only things that are colored here are um, the things that need attention, so our comparisons, whether we're doing better or worse. And then also the inherent meaning in the colors is used in the bottom chart. So these are customer trends over time. Um, anything that is decreasing is shown in red. Anything increasing is shown in green. Again, good versus bad. Anything that's neutral is shown um, in a neutral color, so new or lost. Uh, sort of those are colors that don't have meaning, but they work well with the, pop, the color palette here. This is the same example um, just flown off as a, as a bubble chart. In this case, we don't have any color on the bubbles. If I were to add colors onto the uh, bubbles here, onto each one of these points, I want to make sure that I do it in such a way that creates information density. So adding either another um, measure or dimension or uh, some type of piece of information that is attached to that color that helps uh, the user get more out of the visualization in a, in a smaller screen real estate. As we're winding down here, some tips, things to keep in mind on your next build. Uh, tools versus toys. So great design, good visualization, great layout, all those principles we talked about, it solves the problem. It's there to present the underlying data to the consumer of that information. It's not there to be the star of the show. So if they're using, if dashboards, visualizations are using, being used to answer questions, um, keep sort of the flashing is out of it as much as you can. Allow it to do what it's supposed to do. It's a tool to gather information. It's a tool to make decisions. It's not necessarily a tool uh, or a toy to be played with. Something else is the trade-off between complexity and um, time to understanding. And I think this probably makes sense for anyone who's eaten at a, a restaurant with a, a huge menu um, as opposed to one with a very small menu. The more choices you have, the more time it takes you to analyze those choices, to understand those choices, and ultimately to make a decision. So find that balance in your visualization and your dashboard design um, between how complex things are and um, how quickly they need to be used or consumed. Think back also to the different types of dashboards that we talked about. Um, if it's something that's strategic, um, you could probably get away with the equal balance of these things. If it's something that's tactical, it's going to be more complex because there's more analysis being done. It's okay if it takes longer to get to an answer. And then if it's something that is um, operational, the complexity needs to be very low, so the time to understand can be very short. Um, sort of if you take what type you're building, keep this slide in mind as well. 
know, how, how quickly, how complex are we making things? Uh, lastly, here we have you know, choose the right tool for the job. And this is where we get into making a decision about what chart type or what visualization we use for the types of data we have to analyze. And I, I have listed here at the bottom of the slide where I pulled this screenshot from. This is not something that I had created. But these can be found all over the web. Um, they can be found uh, probably in any visualization book that you pick up. So uh, this is not something that we devoted a ton of time to today um, because flow charts like this that are available do a pretty good job to help you understand the type of data you have and where it fits for a visual visualization. So choosing the right tool uh, for the job is also very important, but these uh, types of flowcharts are very helpful for doing that. And in addition to that, meet the purpose statement in the simplest way possible. So while you're choosing the right tool for the job, um, if something like this works for the data that you have to present, um, don't try to use something like this. Um, only use, uh, use things, use the least complex visualization possible for the information that you have to present. Things like core diagrams, um, heat maps, um, a lot of the new visualizations that are hot today are useful for analyzing certain types of information, whether it be a specific relationship or something with a geo context. Um, these types of visualizations are useful, but don't use them for the sake of using them just because they're popular today. Um, pick the right tool for the job. Pick something as simple as possible to convey that information and allow your users to easily um, consume, easily and quickly consume um, as much out of your visualizations as possible. And then lastly, the last tip I have for everyone is to break the rules. Um, there will be times during your design process, uh, during development, during analysis, where maybe a chart type that's recommended for a certain data set that you have just doesn't work, or um, you, you need, for whatever reason, to break the use, the inherent meaning and colors. Um, don't be a, a slave to the rules. Use them as, a, as guidance, but ultimately your goal is to communicate the information in the most effective way. So being that you understand that information and you understand your audience, um, use these principles to guide you there that don't necessarily um, allow them to chain you in any one direction. So thank you for attending the Data Visualization and Dashboard Design Webinar. I uh, hope the information that we've seen here has put you on a trajectory uh, to better dashboard design success. So I'm going to take a look now and see if there's any questions that have come through um, during the presentation. Looks like we don't have any questions. Um, I'm going to hang on the line for a couple minutes just to make sure that there are none. And um, again, I thank everyone for the participation today. Um, have a great afternoon. Thank you. So one question that um, has come through here, if we have a standard portfolio, we typically show those options. Um, we, we sort of do. So we, the technology that we use at John Daniel Associates um, are Click, so Click View and Click Sense, and also um, Cognos, uh, their suite of products. So we, depending on each one of those technologies, um, especially in the Click technology set, we have uh, applications that are actually published by Click that show all the different options. And then we also pull from, um, in, the, in the instance of Click Sense, from online visualization libraries like uh, D3. So if you're interested in seeing 
some different sort of charting options. Um, D3 is a JavaScript charting engine. Um, it's open source, and any of those visualizations that you see there can be integrated into uh, a Click Sense application. So if you're interested in getting an idea of different ways to present information, um, take, a, take a look there for a library, but typically that's what we'll present to our customers. We usually shy away from presenting things as sort of a pick list um, because a lot of times the flashier things will be chosen by the users and those flashy visualizations don't necessarily always satisfy the needs that ultimately they're trying to hit. So we, we try to understand the requirements before we present the options for the visualization. All right, looks like there's no other questions, so I'm going to end the session. Thank you again, everyone.